And welcome, everyone. It's 9 o'clock Mountain Time, and uh, I'm excited today because, hey, we have got Steve Conover is with us. Steve is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> he is the neutering, uh, the author of Neutering the National Debt, uh, retired from senior management role uh, with a Fortune uh, uh, 50 company, holds a BS in engineering, MBA in finance, PhD in uh, political uh, economy, and uh, man, it's a uh, uh, it's always great to talk to him. I've interviewed him uh, many times before. And Steve, uh, pleasure to uh, see you again. Uh, we've interviewed each other many times, but uh, this is the first time we've seen each other, I think. So yeah. <laughs> this is kind of cool. <laughs> Welcome. How you doing? I'm doing well. This has always been fun for me. So thanks for yeah. having me. Well, uh, you know, I, we... Uh, now that we're doing these podcasts, we haven't, you haven't always been available when we're on the radio show. So, uh, right. this is great that we can kind of get you here once in a while, but, uh, we want to jump right into this. Uh, we want to talk about, uh, the, uh, debt, uh, national debt, because it's, uh, the government seems to, uh, uh, just pull money out of nowhere, Steve. Uh, and, uh, let's start off with the debt clock. Uh, what, what does the debt clock tell us or not tell us? Uh, we, we, uh, every TV show puts it up, you know, every citizen owes this much and every taxpayer owes this much. And uh, how serious is that debt clock? Um, the debt clock um, is kind of a thorn in my side because it's like somebody, and I said this in the book, this example, it's like, let's say you're in your car and you're listening to the radio, uh, to the Super Bowl on the radio, and the announce and halftime comes along, and the announcer says, "Well, it's halftime at the Super Bowl, and the score is Green Bay 21." Yeah, <laughs> and then they cut to a commercial, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do you have all the information you need? No. Well, that's my problem with the debt clock. Yeah, the debt's a huge number. Okay, you look at it and how many digits long is it? And uh, it's pretty scary. But what is missing is comparing to something that would put it into context. And a lot of people say the debt to the size of the economy is a good ratio to look at. And I would be happy if they would change to that. But no, everybody that wants to make some kind of a political point um, against whoever's holding the White House, whoever's yeah. occupying the White House, uses the debt clock, one big number, one big scary number with no indication of whether the burden of that debt is affordable. Well, that's that's the thing. Uh, you know, as I said, it. Uh, I don't remember during the uh, last political campaign, I don't remember a single candidate, and uh, there was a whole bunch of uh, Democrats running, obviously. Um, and I don't remember a single candidate saying, oh, my God, we got to do something about the debt. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the candidates wanted to give everybody a thousand bucks a month. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, uh, that was and, Andrew Yang. You know, yeah, I, Andrew Yang. Yeah, we can get into that because I think that's a better idea than another alternative that's being proposed. But we're not we're not on that particular topic just yet. No. Well, the uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up with you, Steve, um, uh, the growing debt and the shrinking debt bur uh, burden. Now, we're we're talking about confusing numbers here because everybody points to the debt going up. But is the is the burden of the debt shrinking? Uh, I think it's been creeping up just a little, you know, not appreciably, but I think it's a little higher than back when I wrote the book. When I wrote the book, it was right on. Okay, first we better de define debt burden, okay? Mm -hmm. My idea of a decent measure of the burden of the debt is um, the interest payments we have to make on the debt. We can't get out of those. How much are we paying out in interest on the debt compared to how much we're taking in in tax revenue, okay? Uh, the more we're taking in in tax revenue, the more um, debt service we're able to afford. So yeah. 
And when I was, uh, when I wrote the book, if I remember correctly, the interest payments on the debt were 8%. I think maybe it was even a little less than that, 7% of the tax receipts. Now I think it's up around, it crept up uh, for obvious reasons. Um, it crept up since then, that was five or six years ago, to about 9% of tax receipts, I believe. Yeah, that, uh, and I think that's why they don't talk about it. You know, when we talk about in our own personal lives, uh, we talk about can we service the debt we have? Can we pay our mortgage? Can we make a car payment? Can we put food on the table, roof over our heads and all of that? And if we can comfortably do that and, you know, we are going to have some debts. Uh, people have mortgages, you know, they have car payments, they've student loans, you know, you name it. There's debt in most people's uh, uh, somewhere. But uh, as long as you can service that debt, you know, I, I can't I can't afford a, a Gulf a Gulfstream jet uh, plane. Uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett certainly could, but you know they can service that debt. Yeah, and, let's talk about what debt servicing debt means. Yeah, it means paying the interest and the principal on time according to the contract you've got with whoever you're you've borrowed money from. So paying the interest on time and paying the principal back on time. Um, that's what debt, debt service means. And if you don't pay either one of those back on time, according to the original agreement, you're in default. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now let's, let's talk about what it means for the government to service debt and how the government can uh, pay back the interest on time. Well, it, the government sells treasury bonds and uh, that one treasury bond, let's say it's for a thousand dollars. It, uh, it's a promise by the borrower to pay back that thousand dollars according to the terms of the agreement. And usually for treasury bonds, bills and notes, it's like due at the end of the uh, the term of the debt instrument and the interest obviously it's uh, uh, what is it now it's right around not not quite one percent on the shorter term bonds but anyway it's the pay back the interest no pay the interest and pay back the principal on time every time or else you're in default <laughs> well how does the government pay the principal back to somebody that lent the government $1,000. Well, it comes to the end of the term and what the government does is it, and not necessarily in this order, but it sells a brand new $1,000 bond to somebody like Bill Gates or, you know, foreign government um, to get a thousand dollars and then it takes that thousand dollars in essence and hands it to the person that they're uh that had the bond that just matured and that's called rolling over the debt okay so if you've got if a nation the united states if we've got a good enough economy to be able to do that all the people that are thinking about should i or shouldn't i lend the united states government a thousand dollars and there are lots of those out there um you know by buying a, a treasury bond they think well looks to me like the economy is going to be pretty healthy and growing healthier or at least uh staying as healthy as it is now so i've got a lot of confidence that the government's going to be able to continue rolling its debt over and that's how the federal government does it. Yeah. Uh, years ago, I had a loan like that where I would just go up periodically and pay the interest on the loan and the loan would keep on kind of keep on going. But, um, yeah, it's uh, well, the other thing uh, compared to our state of Montana and most states, uh, 
our constitution says we have to balance the budget, but we have an operating budget and we also have a, um, uh, the other, yeah, the, the other one, uh, yeah, the capital budget. And, uh, obviously the operating budget uh, has to balance because it pays everyone and, you know, keeps the government running. The other one, uh, we can borrow money for roads or, uh, you know, bridges or, things that the the state needs to borrow money for and but the government just has one big pot everything goes in <laughs> federal government uh has they put everything in one big bucket yeah that big bucket includes things like uh operate what, what states and what corporations call operating budget on the one hand and the rest of it is or pretty much the rest of it is, is the capital budget. And what's the difference? Well, the operating budget is for paying the current bills. Economists call it consumption. Um, the capital budget is where whoever's uh, got an investment to make spends money right now, like buy a bridge that's going to be uh, producing benefits long into the future or at least past the current fiscal year now the federal government um, looked at separating the unified budget that's what they call the big pot um, into an operating budget and a capital budget those two components but for various reasons they had a debate about it and analyzed what would happen if and th and this was back gosh, must be at least 20 to 25 years ago now. But the analysis in the end said, nah, it'll be too difficult. Let's just leave it all in one big bucket. Well, that's why there's so much confusion uh, today about deficits, because my position is it the operating budget needs to be balanced. The capital budget, I mean, it's it is perfectly okay to spend money on good investments, okay? Um, and to borrow money in order to uh, support that spending. A good example of that is um, in back in, when Thomas Jefferson instructed his agents, his two agents in France to hurry up and quick purchase the Louisiana territory before this deal goes away. Um, so they did. And the government had to borrow quite a bit of money at that time in order to do it. And I don't open, I haven't opened one history book that says, wow, did Thomas Jefferson blow the budget that year? Yeah. That was really terrible. <laughs> spending money that we don't have, you know, what are we going to do about that? Uh, at, matter of fact, it's just the opposite. It turned out to be one of the best investments that we've ever made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've, uh, I've told you before, uh, my parents stuck me with the interstate highway system and the space <laughs> program are the two, two things they <laughs> debt they saddled me with, you know, <laughs> that I've got to pay down. And so uh, I guess I'm passing uh, the COVID uh, situation on to my kids. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the lesson there is, you know, it's not the money, it's what you get for the money. That's right. Yeah, it's what you get. Well, uh, let's talk about uh, the debts had its ups and downs. Uh, you talk about it in your book. When did the when did the debt hit a 30 year low? Well, the debt, it wasn't the debt that hit a 30 year low. I mean, all you got to do is look at the debt clock. Yeah. It was the burden of the, the debt. burden of the debt, burden of the debt, which is as I said in the book, it was um, the way I would prefer to measure it is um, interest payments on the debt compared with uh, tax revenue. Okay, um, if you if you make that calculation and you look back at history, I think it was I don't know sixteen maybe eighteen percent back in the back during the recession of 1980 81 time frame 
so that was that was the peak in that number as far back as I could go and look. Um, the currently, or when I wrote the book, it was about seven or eight percent of tax receipts, interest on the debt. Um, so, and and that turned out to be a thirty or forty year low. I can't remember. I think it was a forty year low, but um, eight percent was a lot lower than it had been before that, which is kind of surprising when you think the debt's been the debt number, the debt clock has been doing nothing but getting larger, except for a couple of years at the end of the Clinton administration. And in the book, I, in one chapter, I forget which one it was, I explain why I think that was uh, not a real good thing to do. Um, you know, I think that was mismanagement of the budget because they, in essence, they were refusing to make some pretty important investments just because the idea of having a surplus in the unified budget was such a popular, politically popular mm. idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we would always like to see. Well, that brings us to the next topic, uh, deficits. Uh, deficits. Deficits are not a problem or are they a problem? What uh, What's your thought on uh, deficits? Are there are two schools of thought on this. The, there's the old traditional school of thought, which means deficits are a problem. Um, deficits t eventually tend to cause inflation. Um, somebody's going to have to pay that back someday, which is not true in a, gr in a good economy, right? Mm -hmm. With an economy, yeah. the size and robustness of our economy, um, having some day to pay the whole thing back is simply not the case. Okay, now the second school of thought, and this, I started, um, I saw this first about, I, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, and it's called Modern Monetary Theory. Now, I let me, caution everybody. I'm not yet an MMT supporter because I think there's a flaw that is not being addressed in it. However, I read, I read all about it, everything I could get my hands on. And by the way, there are two authors that if anybody's interested, um, two authors that people ought to look up. One is Warren Mosler. He wrote a book called soft currency economics and one or two more, I think one more. Um, I read both of those trying to understand, and I think I finally got it, uh, trying to understand what, why is this so much different and why is, why are they saying what they're saying? Like, and w essentially what they're saying in this new school of thought is Deficits are not a problem until inflation sets in. Um, yeah. Don't worry about deficits being a problem uh, in the traditional context. Okay, in other words, deficit, the word deficit is a very politically negative word. Uh, gosh, I think every president or every presidential candidate uh, whenever this subject came up, would say, oh, it's terrible that we've got such a big deficit. Who's going to pay that back? When is, uh, you know, China going to come and demand their money from our grandkids? Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. I think the MMT people have the mechanics of how money works. I think they're correct on that. Okay. It is, it's not like the government has to take in money in order to be able to spend money. That's not the case. The government can spend money uh, into the economy anytime it wants in any amount it wants. Um, the problem is if the government spent money into the economy and never took any money out of the economy, okay, that would be inflationary. I don't think there's any argument 
uh, against. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, put, you know, let's say the government put a billion dollars into the economy or 10 billion or $1 trillion into the economy and didn't tax anybody to make up for what it just put in. Okay. Or didn't sell any treasury bonds. Uh, that would be inflationary and inflation would <laughs> definitely show up at some point if that's what the, uh, the government kept doing. But that's not what happens. Um, the government spends money into the economy and takes in some amount of tax revenue, which takes those some of those dollars back out of the economy. And it also sells uh, treasury bonds which takes dollars out of the economy. So that's why we, that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen much inflation, um, even though we've been running huge deficits. So, mm -hmm. yeah. If that answers the question. But. Yeah. Well, the next, uh, next thing I want to, I want to talk about is some, is a, a Reagan term, I guess. Actually, it started with Will Rogers back in the, Back in the 20s, Will Rogers said that money flows in at the top and it trickles out the bottom. Um, we uh, we have a guy here locally. This is a this is a good story. You appreciate this. This kid was um, uh, he uh, went to MSU on a basketball scholarship. So his parents, who'd saved all their all his life to uh, get the money to send him to college, uh, they gave him uh, that money. Uh, he bought homes. Uh, he was on the basketball team here at MSU. He bought homes with it and moved the team into his homes. Didn't tell them he was their landlord. <laughs> and, and, and the remarkable thing was that he sold these homes right before the 2009 uh, <laughs> banking thing hit. I'm lucky. Yeah. Well, he wanted to start this restaurant. He uh, had a degree in marketing from MSU, wanted to start this restaurant here in town. 11 banks turned him down because he wanted to own the property that the restaurant was on. And they said, boy, restaurants fail at such a rate. Uh, I don't think we want to do that. Well, anyway, the 12th bank said yes. And uh, now he's got three of them around the state. But the point is that uh, everybody in creating this restaurant, uh, creating all the, uh, everything that goes into it got paid before he made anything. So right. the money trickled down to everybody, but the owner, the owner right. was the last yeah. guy to get paid. And that's, that's where I think trickle down. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that, that they think the, you know, just because the CEO in the corner office, <clears throat> Uh, you know, makes, uh, you know, a couple million bucks a year. Uh, he does something to get that money. That's right. Um, and that's my main complaint about trickle down criticism um, is it doesn't take into account the entrepreneur and what's happening with, you know, the entrepreneur is the one taking the big risk, right? Mm -hmm. So the economy is healthy enough and the entrepreneur has money available the entrepreneur is going to say okay i think my idea is going to work so i'm going to hire a contract several contractors to build stuff which is going to take money i'm going to hire employees to uh, make sure the business is operating the way it should that takes a lot of money and usually in the beginning in any situation like that no matter how big we're talking about, as far as the size of the entrepreneur's business, um, usually the first, you know, right out of the box, the first several years, if not quite a while longer than that, uh, the business is losing money because it's spending more than revenue that it's uh, taking in. Um, I believe that's what happened to Jeff Bezos when he started Amazon, how, how long ago was it? 25 years or something? <clears throat> yeah, at least I, he lost, he lost every year for the first like 12 or 15 years, I think. Yeah. Uh, that was a losing business all the way along. Yeah. And he just kept plowing money back into the business because he had confidence that it was going to be a good investment. Turned out it was a pretty good investment. Um, 
and ended up in the long run paying for it more than paying for uh, what was happening in the beginning. Yeah. So trickle down means trickle down economics is not such a bad thing and especially not as bad as the politicians who use that term pejoratively um, make it out to be. I mean, it's a way, it's a way for money to money to actually gush out to, uh, you know, the, the public and mm -hmm. like I said, contractors and employees and uh, law attorneys getting the thing set up um, and the entrepreneur doesn't end up with very much at all in the beginning at least um, and then if the business becomes successful that's when things change and the business um, is thriving or the mm -hmm. or it goes broke you know yeah. the idea <laughs> wasn't as good as it should have been didn't work out as well as it should have and the business goes broke and yeah. the Nor's out the money. Yeah. Well, uh, this uh, business owner that I was telling you about, the restaurant guy, uh, due to some, uh, uh, he had to make some corrections because of the health department, uh, you know, had to reconfigure some things and whatever. Uh, couldn't open on time. He's jumping around trying to find everything he can to keep his employees paid and, you know, pay the bills and everything and keep uh, solvent. And uh, yeah, those things happen. Uh, and uh, you know, entrepreneurs—they uh, they're the people who pretty much always take a risk. Uh, right. So it's not like the entrepreneurs got this big, huge basket of money, and every yeah. once in a while he'll throw a hundred-dollar bill out to you know people. I mean, that the money that the entrepreneur starts with when they start trying a new idea. Mm -hmm just absolutely gushes out to, out yeah. to the public and contractors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the entrepreneur sometimes is uh, not able to make ends meet for a while. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, other, the last thing I want to talk about uh, here, Steve, as we finish up here, uh, the debt ceiling, the, um, the government uh, always seems to be voting every six months or 10 months or whatever, they're going to raise the debt ceiling. And, and um, it, it seems to me like there should be some kind of a percentage or trigger or something that this happens automatically without, you know, shutting the government down. And I don't know that shutting the government down is such a bad idea. They had them all walled in with wire and, uh, and gates. I don't know why they just didn't leave them in there and not let them out. <laughs> I just, I've got a problem with the debt ceiling as yeah. it's currently defined. Yeah. Problem with it. I think it's one of the dumbest ideas uh, that politicians have come up with because what it is, um, it says, yeah, it's, it's like we were talking about before the debt clock. Gee, once that big number ticks up to some arbitrary thing politicians chose, let's say, let's say they picked uh, $25 trillion. So it's not quite there yet. It's climbing, climbing, climbing. And then it hits 25 trillion. Then what do you do? You shut the government down. Well, great. Um, <laughs> that, like I said before, the number on the debt clock or that, let's say the 25 trillion number we just picked, um, is an arbitrary number chosen by politicians. I, I'm saying that debt can't get big enough to become a problem. And I'm saying it's not there yet because the debt number is not the same as the burden of the debt. If we've got a, an economy that is thriving enough to be able to easily afford uh, whatever that uh, interest on that big number is going to be, then we're in fine shape and we're, yeah. we're now. Well, and I think that's why no candidate that I saw uh, even mentioned the debt during the uh, political election. And I haven't seen anybody talking about it now. And they're talking about pulling another, what, three trillion out for infrastructure or, uh, you know, these various bills and everything. Um, so, 
you know, the, the way the government runs and the way, you know, you've articulated it today, um, I, I hope people have a better understanding of how this whole thing uh, works and um, the fear that is instilled by the talking heads um, isn't, isn't to all that real. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I would like to see the government get a little bit more practical in that. And I, I go back to my business experience to me, practical means operating budget, capital budget. And the question on any capital budget idea is, is this a good investment? Should we do it? And if it's a good, if it's a good investment or as best we can tell when we've got to spend, make the decision on whether to spend the money or not, if we decide, yeah, that's a good investment, we ought to spend the money, even if it requires borrowing every dollar of it. Mm -hmm. Now let's take an example. Let's say, um, let's say it would cost, I don't know, $500 billion to make the federal computer systems uh, impervious to attacks from the outside. Okay. Um, let's say it would cost that. I'm saying, well, okay. Making it impervious to attacks means that some hacker would not be able to get in and shut down our electric grid. I mean, I just went through that situation in Texas about a month ago. Yeah. Yeah, you did <laughs> a month ago. And I, I went through it in Florida during a hurricane, the power, not the power, not being on is a huge problem. It's probably the, uh, the biggest problem. One of the biggest problems, uh, behind following any natural disaster, you know, like the, the deep freeze we had in Texas or a hurricane in Florida. Um, so I think it's a good idea to prevent anybody from be able to hack into the systems and shut the entire electric grid down. I think that would be worth probably $500 billion. And I think it would be worth borrowing $500 billion from the public by selling treasury bonds in order to prevent that from happening. So, but a bit, if we had a balanced budget amendment, we wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Because yeah. we, we can't borrow any money if the budget is just barely balanced and this takes an extra 500 billion. Okay. Yeah. No, nope. unconstitutional. You can't prevent the, <laughs> you know, the hackers from shutting down our electric grid because we're out of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We seem to, uh, we seem to be able to appropriate it when we need it for whatever political, uh, expediency right. that will uh, get us votes. But, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> some somebody out here on the street can't get uh, can't get a small business loan because uh, you know they're turned I, down by eleven banks. I would love to see the our politicians in Washington stop debating the deficit. Let's yeah. stop that and let's start debating: Is Idea X a good investment? Mm -hmm. What about this other idea? What about the next idea? Is it a good idea? It, would it be a good investment to prevent the, the electric grid from getting shut down by hackers? Would that be a good idea? Yeah. Would it be a good idea to, um, I don't know, the Green New Deal? I would just, I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm just saying I'd like to see a debate about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a debate for another time. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> that's a long, that's a long debate. <laughs> So there's a lot, there's a lot in there that, uh, you know, as I've, uh, as I've always said, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we couldn't have sped up the evolution of the automobile if we just shot all the horses. Uh, you know, I mean, that wouldn't have made, that wouldn't have made it happen any faster. You know, Henry Ford didn't work on heated cup holders the next day and Alexander Graham Bell and Watson didn't start on texting the next yeah. day. You know, these things, these things come in their own good time through evolution of, 
of products and services. You know, that uh, uh, there's an old um, uh, Twilight Zone about a guy who goes back uh, in time who knows all about oil, uh, buys up all this real estate that he knows oil, <clears throat> oil is there, but <laughs> the technology of the time can't reach the oil. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> he's got all this land he can't do anything with. So, <laughs> yeah. So there's all kinds of, uh, of things like that. Uh, Steve's book uh, is Neutering the National Debt, How the Reagan Got It Right and How Today's Left and Right Get It Wrong. And, uh, of course, uh, he's got the uh, engineering degree, the uh, MBA in finance, PhD in uh, political economy. And um, great. Uh, it's been great talking to you, Steve. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today and uh, educate the folks on the on the debt and um, you know we uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming in and talking well thanks for having me on tom i appreciate yeah. it all right all right and that's going to do it for us so uh, we are going to duck out of here uh just a reminder that uh, we are on uh, radio tomorrow uh, we'll be on uh, from 8 to 11 mountain time uh, click listen live at kmmsam.com and if you missed any of our past shows or any of that, you can pick all those up at uh, uh, at uh, KMMSAM.com as well. So, all right, that's going to do it. So thanks uh, very much, Steve, and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you down the road. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right.